All right. Hello. Hi. Yeah. There you go. What? Oh God. Do I have like a shadow on my face? This is very strange. Oh, I, I, I think I know what's going on. Give me a second. I changed the lights recently. Let me, let me fix the lights. Okay. I want a, I want a sunny face. <laughs> I want a bright face. So that should be here, probably something like this, I guess. Let's let's check it out. Mm, still not great, but better. Um, I wonder if I'm gonna have to change this at some point. This light is just not working. Uh -huh. Well, so this should be one thing to do. And then, well, well obviously that can also be a solution. Oh yeah, because it's actually pretty dark in here right now. So maybe that's just why. But you see, I have this kind of... What if I turn this off? Mm, nope. But if I turn this on, eh, well, I think that's going to have to cut it today because I, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of gloomy and dark in here today in Boston, Massachusetts, which is where I'm calling in from. Where, is, where are all of you calling in from, huh? I see a lot of familiar faces. Dusko, Mahmoud, many familiar faces. How are you folks doing? And uh, oh, oh, let me fix this up. Where is everyone calling in from? Um, I like to know where people are based. It's kind of nice. It makes me feel like I am around real human beings, which I am. But 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 sometimes you know, with all the screens and all the technology, it feels it feels difficult. Oslo. Whoa! I was in Oslo. When was that? I was in Oslo in the summer of 1999. It was really, really beautiful. Very nice. I was also a student <laughs> and it was incredibly expensive. <laughs> I was planning on staying there for a week and I had to leave like third day or something. I don't know. Egypt. Oh, Tehran, Serbia, Brussels. <laughs> this is very nice. I love it. We're in Egypt, Cairo, and we're in Serbia. Ah, all right. Okay. Um, all right. Let me pull up my notes for a second, and then we're about to start. What is this? Uh. Oh, okay. All right. So yeah, what are my notes here? And then we can officially get started. Uh, uh. Are my notes? Yeah. Okay. And then Have that in the okay. All right, I think we're good. Shall we start? All right, three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. This is Parametric Camp. This guy is Jose Luis. We do live streams, we talk computational design, we nerd out, and um, we try to be creative using technology. That's kind of what uh, we do in this channel. Oh, Mehras. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very happy you find them useful. Uh, so, what are so what is for? If any of you are new to this channel, what we do is we go live. We record tutorials live with people on the chat, giving me suggestions, reminding me of things that I say wrong, calling it out when my microphone goes out of battery, which is about to go in a few seconds right now, and uh, and then we edit them and then we post them online in the form of 
single videos or typically in the form of a playlist that people can use to learn stuff. And right now we are in the middle of recording a new playlist that is called Advanced Development in Grasshopper, where we're talking how to write code inside of Grasshopper, how to um, create our own components, and we will eventually end up developing our own plugins. That's the goal of this playlist that we're working on right now. So um, now if you like what you see, perhaps you may want to consider subscribing or liking these videos, or you may also want to join us on Discord. We have a Discord where we have conversations offline throughout the week. The link is in the description of this video. And we also have, if you want to know when we go live, you can follow us on social media. We're mostly active on, so on Instagram and, with, and on stories. But I also have a Google Calendar that you can subscribe. And then uh, the event, whenever we go live, that will show up if you are subscribed. So, so yes, so the Google Calendar link is also on the description of this video. Now, what are we doing today? Well, I think the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to change the batteries of this thing because they're going to die right now. And then the second thing is we're going to talk about what we're doing today. So let me grab, let me get some batteries. Uh, I really need to get a new microphone. I'm very tired of the situation, but I keep saying it and I don't get it, huh? Uh, I don't know. You know, partly... The reason is that I'm not really sure which microphone I want. And I think that's kind of what, what's not helping here. Because this one is nice. I actually like the lapel thing. But finding a version of this that is wireless and USB and where it's not easy, actually. So let me go mute for a second. All righty, sound, yes, okie dokie. So what are we doing today? We're going to continue with the advanced development in Grasshopper playlist. It's gonna be short because I have stuff to do. I have to prepare a class for tomorrow. So um, we're gonna do one or two videos at most. And also I wanna record a small, a short video that I'm going to be posting on my personal channel because it turns out that um, for a variety of reasons, uh, we had to take down the, the videos that I have for my lectures on my Harvard course, the Introduction to Computational Design. So I want to record a small video where I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to send people here to Parametric Camp. Okay, so that's going to be the plan for today. So let's get started then. How The first thing we're going to do is the the tiny video uh, oh, no nope, not this <laughs> yeah what's going on it's just it's like yeah mm. i wonder if we can just okay so how about this uh, how about if i do this well this is a lot <laughs> Is, is, is a lot. Uh, well, maybe it's not too bad, no? Is it too bad? I think the light is a bit more homogeneous now. Correct? Mm hmm. Okay. All right. So, yes. So, mm hmm. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to change the back, this back. I'm going to use the intro one. And then I'm going to refer people to, I'm going to refer people to the live stream. No, I think so, yes. Okay, 
So let me do that. Mm. I'm going to add an image here. I'm going to add an image here and that's going to be just this 639. Okay, and then an image. Hi Raju from India. What time is it in India? It's pretty late now, isn't it? It's in like uh it's nine and a half hours, right? So that's no eleven and a half, I forget. But it's it's far. India is pretty far from here. Or I'm really far from India. <laughs> yeah, that's another way of looking at it. At it. Uh, okay. Uh, oops, that did not. Okay, so that should be here, I guess. Yes. Um, uh, but I think I may want to, I don't want to I don't want all of that to fall, whatever. I may have to do another one. So wait, 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 wait. So where do I have that? It's gonna be boring. <laughs> Let me find the Illustrator file that I have with all of that, and then we can export just gonna I'm just gonna let you check out what we're doing here um uh, I can probably just uh nope just remove all of this and then just export this I can probably just export that uh -huh. And then this, and then this. I think I need to export a 72, correct? And yes, that's perfect. Well, hold on, that's actually not perfect. Because the name is not great. Ah, the name is fine. Okay, so then then if I go back here, then this file should be this file. Mm -hmm. Hi there from, oh, from Aus München. <laughs> Hello. I used to live in Stuttgart. <laughs> feel, feel Lange. <laughs> oh God, that was a long time ago. I saw photos the other day, it was embarrassing. <laughs> Okay, um, oh, all right, stories about WebSockets. Yeah, we have a full playlist that is called Fun with WebSockets, if you're interested in that. And we teach how to use WebSockets to make a lot of processes communicate with each other. It's a lot of fun. Check it out here on the video. Um, on the channel. And then here, what I'm going to do is, um, <clears throat> and then I'm going to go to playlists, and then I'm going to go to intro, and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to, okay, I think this should be fine. I want to be here, so I want to be saying, yeah, blah, 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 whatever. We can make them accessible, but if you want, you're welcome to come and check out the work that we're doing here. We have a lot of playlists around different topics. And then, yes. And, um, and then, for example, what is parametric modeling, learning C sharp, and then, Okay, and that I will probably try to make some mm, some content similar to that um, available at some point here, I guess. Okay, I'm going to do that. So that's going to be the video.
Let's get started. Hi, my name is Jose Luis, and if you're watching this video, it's probably because YouTube, Google, some link or someone has brought you to this playlist, which is what I used to hold the lectures for the course that I teach at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that unfortunately, for several reasons, we had to take those videos down and they're not going to be available anymore. But the good, re the good news though is that uh, during the past year or two years, I've been working on this parallel project called Parametric Camp, which is a YouTube channel that is dedicated specifically to computational design. So if you are interested in the topic of computational design, I would like to welcome you to check out the, this YouTube channel, the description, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> starting over again. <laughs> I'm starting over again. Hi, my name is Jose Luis. And if you are watching this video, it's probably because YouTube, Google, some external link somewhere have directed you to this playlist where I used to host the lectures for the course that I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. It used to be all the lectures and the exercises for that. No, that's not the exercises. Those are not the exercises. Uh, what am I going to? Oh. They're not the exercises. Those exercises didn't used to be there. Um, I don't want to say that. Um, but what I want to say is, hmm. okay, let me try it again. Hi, my name is Jose Luis over there and welcome, oh. <laughs> starting over again, over again. Hi, my name is Jose Luis, and if you're watching this video, it's probably because YouTube, Google, some external link, something redirected you to this playlist where I used to host the lectures that I, the lectures for my class, Introduction to Computational Design, that I teach at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. For, uh, I have, <laughs> going over. Hi, my name is Jose Luis, and if you're here, it's probably because YouTube, Google, uh, some external link or something brought you to this channel and to this playlist where I used to hold the lectures for the class that I teach at Harvard Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. I got good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that for a variety of reasons, uh, we had to take down the videos and they're not going to be available anymore. But the good news is that uh, actually thanks to COVID, I last year and two years ago, I started this new project called Parametric Camp, which has been a YouTube channel where I've been doing live streams on computational design and recording tutorials live with the help of many people who are assisting me and we are, who are on the, in the chat, I'm getting, I'm getting, starting over again. <laughs> I got, I got, I got confused. Hi, this is Jose Luis here. And if you are here, it's probably because YouTube, Google, or some external link sent you to this playlist where I used to hold 
the videos and the lectures for the class that I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. I got good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that for a variety of reasons, those videos had to be taken down and they will not be available anymore. However, the good reason, the good news, I got reasons? No, the reason, did I say reasons? Start, starting over again. Wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> You see, this is what happens. You spend two weeks without live streaming and you lose it. You totally lose it. <laughs> That's why we have to stream every week to keep it rolling. Okay. So I feel this is going to be a good one. Okay. So I'm just going to calm down a little and say what I have, what I want to say. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hi, this is Jose Luis here. And if you got to this video, it's probably because YouTube, Google, or any other external link brought you to this playlist where I used to hold the videos and the recordings of the lectures the, of the class that I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. Um, if that's the case, then I got good news and bad news for you. Bad news is that the, for a variety of reasons, uh, we had to take down those, those videos and they will not be available anymore. However, the good news is that in the past year and a half, two years, and actually thanks to COVID, I have started this new project called Parametric Camp, which is a YouTube channel specifically dedicated to the topic of computational design. And most of what I do is that I go live and we record live streams and we actually have we're already up to live stream 82, which is when I'm recording this. And um, in this live stream, we record tutorials live with the help of many people who join me on the chat. And then we edit them and we make them available as single videos or as series or courses that you can follow to learn to go deeper into specific topics. So if you're interested in the topics that you are going to find in the Introduction to Computational Design class, we are covering many of those and we will continue to cover more and more of those in all these series that I'm making. So if you go to the playlist sections, you can find several collections of videos and some of them more structured as courses or a series, like for example, the Introduction to Parametric Modeling playlist, where I teach you from scratch, no assumptions whatsoever, how to use parametric modeling and how to do it with Grasshopper and Rhino. Or for example, we have this other series called Learning C Sharp, Introduction to Computational to Computer Programming for Designers, where I also teach you the art of computer programming from scratch with no assumptions whatsoever in using the C Sharp programming language. And last but not least, right now, I'm in the middle of recording this new playlist called Advanced Development in Grasshopper, which is kind of the two previous ones combined, the advanced version of the two previous ones. You know Grasshopper, you know how to write C Sharp. So how do we put this together and how do we learn to code inside of Grasshopper, create our own components and end up making our own plugins. So I think that is a pretty interesting topic. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the... the <clears throat> Ah, I was doing so well. What happened? <laughs> I did not think how I wanted to finish the video. So that's going to be by doing this and switching this. Can I do that? Uh, can I actually do that without? Um, Can I do that without switching? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to do it again. And then I'm going to go back here. And then I'm going to switch. And then I'm going to say, perhaps at some point, perhaps at some point in the future, I have a playlist that it's much closer, high level to what we used to do here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to do that.
Hi. Hi, <laughs> what? <laughs> Starting over again. Hi, my name is Jose Luis, and if you're watching this video, it's probably because YouTube, Google, or some external link brought you to this playlist where I used to have the lectures and the videos for the class that I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design called Introduction to Computational Design. Well, uh, I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that for a variety of reasons, uh, we had to take down those videos and they will not be available anymore. But the good news is that in the past year and a half, two years, I've been working on this new project called Parametric Camp, which is a YouTube channel that is dedicated fully and specifically to computational design. What I do with this channel is that I go live, so we record live streams, and during those live streams, like the one that I am right now, during those live streams, I record tutorials, I record videos with the help of people who join me live on this, on the, on the chat. And then we take those videos and we cut them, we edit them, and we turn them into pieces of knowledge that we hope are useful for many of you. So if you actually go to the playlist, you can see that we have a lot of series about of videos that we think are useful in the field of computational design. And many of them are actually designed to be more like courses or things that you can follow through to learn more about specific topics in computational design. Such as, for example, my introduction to parametric modeling series were from scratch, without assumption, I introduce you to the art of parametric modeling with the tools of Grasshopper and Rhino. Or, for example, I have another series called Learning C Sharp, Introduction to Computer Programming for Designers, where I also introduce viewers to the art of writing computer code um, from scratch without no previous knowledge and using the C Sharp programming language. And last but not least, the one that I'm currently right now in the middle of recording, which is called Advanced, Advanced Development in Grasshopper, which it's kind of the child course or the child series to the previous two ones. So if you know Grasshopper and if you know how to write C-sharp code, how can we mix those two together and then, um, and then create our own Grasshopper components, create our own plugins and do advanced development within Grasshopper, all right? So um, I am sorry that the videos are not available anymore, but hopefully with the work that we do at Parametric Camp, maybe you can find a lot of similar interesting topics. Many of those are already here. And also many of the content that I developed for Parametric Camp is the content that I use as support material for my class at the university. So I'm pretty confident that you will find this material useful. And last but not least, maybe at some point soon, I can put together some material that is very, very similar in spirit to the one that I used to have in the lecture recordings, and we can make it available through Parametric Camp, all right? So I strongly suggest that you check the project out. There is a link in the description and there should be a car popping up somewhere here on the corner and hope to see many of you over here. All right, thank you very much, and I'm sorry, and also I'm not sorry. Let's, uh, let's uh, put <laughs> more energy, and let's make this project much more awesome than it already is, All right? Thank you very much, and see you on Parametric Camp. All righty, I do need coffee. You're right, Albert. I kind of have a tiny bit of coffee, but it's clearly not enough, right? Rosalotus from Dallas. Oh, nice. I've been to Houston. No, sorry, I've been to Austin. I had not I don't know. I don't know Dallas, unfortunately. But I hear it's nice over there, isn't it? Uh oh. Oh, I'm destroying my setup. Oh, it's kind of warm here today. Let me put on the fan on the window. All right. Okay, so that video is done. So now we can focus on, we can focus on C sharp development, right? Grasshopper development. Yoohoo! Okay. How's everyone doing there?
Mm -hmm. All right, so 21, 22, what is this? We're in 20 seconds. Um, I'm writing myself a couple notes here. Uh, uh. All right, and then what else? What else? So what are we doing today? Okay, so today we are doing... So what, what have we done? <laughs> what have we done? So um, let me double check. So, all right, if we do a dashboard, um, all right, so, which content is, uh, okay, so we have done data trees in Grasshopper, and no, we've done data components, okay, and then we have to do component messages, all right, that's going to be very cool. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so, all right, so let's do this. Okay, we're going to do this, we're going to shut this down, and then, mm -hmm. Hey, Pixel Car, hola. <laughs> all right. And then what are we doing today? Um, okay, so what are we gonna do today is, yes, we're going to do, we're going to do, what are we going to do? We're going to do, okay, so have, we're going to take the C sharp script component, we're going to go inside and we're going to learn a little bit of all this stuff that is right here. Okay, so we're going to learn about all of this here. All right, which is kind of a lot. <laughs> and, um, and, so how are we going to call, because what I want to do in this video, I want to do a video where I'm going to explain how to use the component property to, to the, how to use the script to the component to use error messages, to display error messages. And then for, I'm going to, Right, I'm going to, we're going to make a second video where we're going to take components that we have done and we're going to introduce error handling, which is going to be, we're going to pop out messages. We're going to pop messages depending on when things are done correctly, incorrectly, etc., etc. So we're going to learn good practices here. So how are we going to call the video? Because I wanted to do component messages, but I don't think that's a little reductionist. Um, so maybe, maybe we can call it understanding script instances. That could be a good, Understanding script instances. That could be a good video name. Uh -huh. So we're going to do that. We're going to explain all of this here. And then we're going to do the error handling. Okay. And how are we going to start? I probably want to start from... 
some previous video, uh, some previous exercise. So I think what we're going to do then, I'm going to I'm going to stop Dropbox because otherwise it's going to go nuts. And then I'm going to take this video and that's going to be understanding script instances. Okay, and then data components. I'm going to take this video. And actually, you know what, actually, I think this is a little bit of an overhead. So what I want is, let's say we create, and actually, I don't think I need this. So let's say we create a, a point from x, y, and c coordinates. Well, I, we have this somewhere, don't we? Yeah, vector components, construct point. Okay, so let's take this. Just paste it here. Okay. All right, and then we have this here. And then and what happens if I do reflect reflect on P? What do we get here? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I think I can start with this. All right, we're going to start with this. And so I'm going to uh, click this. <clears throat> All right. So let's start with that. So I'm going to start the video and then I'm going to zoom in the component and then I'm going to explain like what is it exactly a grasshopper component. And then we're going to discuss how the grasshopper component is basically a class that gets instantiated that inherits from an original class and that has a method that is the one that the component is the one that the component uses to execute the code. So it's a function that gets executed by the document, the owner. And that from a C-sharp perspective, basically all components are instances of a class that are interconnected with each other. Um, I think that's pretty good thing. Yeah, I think that probably works. Okay. And I'm going to All right. Hi, my name is Jose Luis and welcome to another video here at Parametric Camp on this series advanced development in Grasshopper. Uh, blah, 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 over again. What is it that I typically say? Welcome to another video in par at Parametric this was at least at parametric camp. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I typically say. Okay, let's go again.
Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would actually like to go even a little deeper into the C Sharp script component and use this as a way to understand what are actually Grasshopper components. So we know that from a UI standpoint is this box with these connectors, these letters, etc. But if we were only looking at a Grasshopper component from a computer science perspective, from a computer programming perspective, what is a Grasshopper component actually? And how does that integrate with everything that we know from programming in C Sharp, like functions, classes, object-oriented programming, etc.? How are those two things, those two worlds related? So I would like to, in this video, go in a little deeper into how that works and use this as a way to understand what additional functionality and what other possibilities do we have now that we are learning how to write our own C Sharp script components and how we will have even more power as soon as we transition to compiling our own native components and creating Grasshopper plugins. So I'm going to start with a, an example that we have done here in the series, which is a very simple construct point component, which is a C Sharp script component. And if I double click here, you can see that we have all the stuff that is familiar to us already. We have the run script, and then we have the code that we have written inside. But so far up to this point in this series, we've kind of forgotten about everything else that was over here. So for this one, I would actually like to go ahead and to functions. I'm going to expand also the using the using uh, area. And with this, what I would like to bring forth is the fact that a grasshopper component internally is nothing more or nothing less than actually super, super conventional C sharp code. If you look at this, this looks exactly like any other file that we could work with on Visual Studio. It looks like a C sharp file, C sharp code file. And the structure is also super similar. We have at the beginning, we have a block where we can import our own library. So by default, we use system, we use the Rhino common, and we use the Grasshopper SDK, which I will get to in a few videos. And then also we have here a section where I could myself load some additional libraries if I wanted to, which I will also get to on how to do that in further videos down the road. But what's more interesting here is the fact that this was kind of hidden for us, but run script, this function, the main function that gets executed every time we run a, gra a component, a grasshopper component, and the one where we have written our code is nothing more and nothing less than a function, a very particular function, that lives inside of a larger class that is called script instance. And this class is very interesting because it inherits from this grasshopper script instance superclass, which means that it takes a lot of functionality and it takes a lot of the logic from its parent. And additionally, we can see that because it's a class, it has a particular function that Grasshopper probably knows how to execute and probably Grasshopper knows how to take data that is coming from an input and turning that into an argument that gets passed into the function, etc., etc. And Grasshopper also knows how to take the output that we generate and we reference and then place that in the wire that flows out of the component. So all of that is probably handled by Grasshopper. But what's interesting is that we actually have access to a lot of other functionality that comes from the fact that this component is just an instance. It's an object in itself that has been instanced and is a child of a larger class that is the base. And because we are inheriting from a base, we will have all that additional functionality. So for example, what does that mean? Well, when I was saying before that we can use the print function to just print some value to the console, for example, hello world, right? And I, if I execute this, you can see that from the output, I'm getting that message here. What this is, 
this function is not just a function that lives in ether or in limbo. This function is a function that is available because here it's part of the implementation that comes with script instances. And as you can see, we can see that this function, there are two versions of this function. The one that takes one string of text and the other one that takes a string of text and a series of arguments afterwards that we can use for formatting the string. So for example, I can say here, hello world. And then here I can type world. And then I believe, uh, well, let's say Jose Luis to change. And if I execute this, you can see that this gets changed. So if you don't understand this, actually, I have another video on my learning C sharp playlist where I talk about string interpolation. So there should be a link on the description or popping up with a card somewhere here. So make sure to go check it out uh, so that you can understand this better. All right. And but this is also the reason why, for example, we cannot just print a number, right? So if I hit execute this, you can see that script instance, the class that we're living in dot print doesn't take doesn't have any overload This takes a pure integer as a an argument. All right, it's just not part of the implementation. So are things now starting to is the puzzle starting to fit together? Are the pieces starting to fit together? So for example, we have this other method that we have not seen in this videos, which is reflect and reflect basically prints useful information about an instance of an object to the out parameter. So for example, here I have a point that I have created. I have created as an instance. So if I say reflect, if I say print P, then I'm going to get an error because I cannot print a point object, but I could convert this to a string, right? And then if I did that, then I will get some string representation of that point. However, if instead of that, what I use is reflect, what I will see is that through the output, I will print out uh, a reflected version of all the properties and all the methods that the point 3D structure has. So you can see that we can do multiply, that we can find the coordinates x, y, z, that we can have the distance to, etc. So we have a lot of functionality that we can analyze using the reflect method. Okay. And you can also say, see that you can have a special version for a method name. So for example, if I want to say subtract, then I will get additional information. And then the information that I see is what are the references? What is it that this method takes? What are the overloads? So for example, I can subtract a vector and a point and it returns a point and I can subtract a point and another point and it returns a vector in return. All right. Actually, I believe this reading here that you see is actually Visual Basic, which I don't know why it's printing this out in Visual Basic, but that's that's what it is. All right. But these were methods, these were functions that live inside of this script instance, which is inside of this class, which is exactly what a grasshopper component is. But if we go to members, this is where actually the real power is, in my personal opinion. Uh, because for example, you can see that here we have, for example, we have a private integer that tells us how many times this component has executed, which is kind of cool. So for example, if I say print this component has run and then this dot iteration, because remember we are in a class, so I can use the this dot to refer to them a member that lives inside of this on this on this class. Um, and then I can close this and execute this and it says this component has run zero times. It runs has run zero times because 
I just changed the code so everything got reset. But for example, if I now hit OK, and then if I start moving this, you can see that Is that not working? Wow, why is that not working? Huh. Wow, that is very strange. Interval. Huh. Yeah, this is ticking. Oops. What is going on here? Iteration time. The first round, iteration zero, and the second. What? This is so not cool. Print iteration. This is not working. Why is this not working? Mm -hmm. Huh. It is not working. All right, shall we do some Googling? Mm. Oof, look. <laughs> Uh, Google is recommending us. That's kind of nice. Key nine, this run, run script. Huh. All right. That is pretty neat. And then iteration. Nope. Iteration. Uh, oh, not finding. Okay, so this is very strange. All right, so we're going to pass on that one. <laughs> Okay, let me card two. Okay. Hey, Kartik, you just got me right now when nothing is working. <laughs> okay.
Well, um, I am actually not sure why this is not working. I believe that this should work, but maybe there's something going on. But anyway, um, it doesn't really matter because actually I would like to in I would like to to explain to you how to implement this manually yourselves. So don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna get back to this in 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 a second in the future. But for example, one of the super super interesting things is that we have access to a to three references that point to um, the document in Rhino that we're working with, the document in Grasshopper, so the whole definition that we're working with, and this particular instance of this component. And what that allows us to do is because we have access to places where we can query and we can ping the component, we can ping the Grasshopper document and the Rhino component and the Rhino document, there's a lot of stuff that we can do actually. And there's where these are actually the three MVPs, the most valuable players, if you will, uh, of the Grasshopper component development, if, in my opinion. So for example, what we can see is that if I type component and I type dot, what you can see is I start getting access to a lot of stuff that is part of how Grasshopper components work. All right. And there are many properties, methods, you can subscribe to events and Actually, this can get pretty, pretty hacky. And I'm not, I will explain in the next video where to take a look at documentation and how to learn about this. But for example, uh, one thing that I think it's super interesting, one function that I think it's super interesting is called the add runtime message. What does that mean? From this component, I can call the add runtime message method. And what I can do is I can use this method to pop up one of those tiny balloons that are clear, orange, or red, and that I can use to express error messages or warnings. So for example, let's say that I wanted this message to this component to display a normal balloon, like, and so a normal balloon with, uh, with, uh, with some kind of hello message. So what I can do, is I can, I can call the runtime message method, and then I can choose first which type of message I want to display, and the type is chosen by using the grasshopper runtime message level enumerator, and then I can press dot, and I have four options, just blank, error, remark, or warning. So for example, let's say I wanna do a remark, all right? And then the message is going to be, hello, P camp, all right? And then what I can do is if I execute this, you can see that I have this tiny bubble now on top of the component. And if I click, you can say, hey, hello, P camp. So I've created a tiny bubble that it's right over there. So for example, uh, something that I could do is I could say, if the point, the X coordinate equals, zero or no, it's less than zero and p dot y is less than zero and p dot c is also less than zero. Something that I could do, this is terrible, but for example, I could say add component, run, add component, blah, 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 and then the runtime message and I could say warning and I could say your point is on the negative octant. If in case that was something to be uh, worried about, which I don't know why it should be, right? But you see now, for example, I can move this all the way to negative. Oh my God, then I'm gonna have to change this because of course, <laughs> and now we can move this to negative and negative and negative. And you can see that the component now turns orange and it gives me this message, your point is on the negative octant, all right? Or, or I could instead, for example, if I needed to, I could turn that into an error, right? And then I can just execute this and now this gives me an error, all right? The component doesn't stop working, so it still generates the point, but it goes red and it flags this kind of like error, like your point is negative, whatever, blah, 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 I don't know why. But this is a really good way in the world of Grasshopper of signaling problems and letting people know that uh, something is not go go going well, all right? So um, 
For example, let's see a couple of real world examples that I would like to show you before we move on to the next video you, about doing error handling. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I've been there for a while. <clears throat> okay. Oh, ah. Ah. Oh. <clears throat> So for example, if we go back to the plugin that we've been developing throughout this series, if we go to the vector components, if you remember the twin vector, the twin, the, the twin vector component that we made, this was a component that we could use to twin a two vectors from one to the other. And actually, let me add some visualization here so that we can see it better, okay? <clears throat> right. Okay, one vector, and then the other vector is going to be this one, and the point is going to be mm -hmm. Okay, here you go. So I have the two vectors, the one on the first one and the second one, and have the twin vector. And we know that whenever the parameter approximates zero, then the vector is equal to the first one. And when the parameter gets to one, then the twin vector is equal to the second one. But twinning is typically an operation that is performed proportionally from zero to one, like the normalized range between two extremes, right? However, Mathematically, it doesn't have to be the case. It can go from anywhere negative to anywhere positive. It doesn't really matter. However, um, because it's not a very intuitive concept when we go beyond the zero to one range. So maybe we want to add here a warning where it say, hey, just so you know, your tweening parameter is outside the zero to one range. Just in case, it's fine. We can take care of that. We can deal with that but it may not be um, what you want to do, just letting you know. So we can do that by saying, by going here and then say on the algorithm, we can just add, add here a warning just in case. And then we can say here, for example, if the parameter T that we're tweening from is less than zero or the parameter T that we're using for tweening is greater than one, then maybe there's something that the user didn't really do correctly. Or maybe they do, they just, we just want to warn them. So remember, in the component, we have access to the component object. 
which is a reference to the parent that is owning this one script. So think of, think of this as the component being the whole thing, the UI, the buttons, the, the, the buttons, the wires, the right click, this menu, that's the component. And then the script, which is what we are working with, the script instance, is the code, just the code part that is running inside. All right. So, um, oops, what did I do? Oh, I didn't save. I didn't save that. Okay. So add a warning here. I don't, I think I closed this without. So if T is less than zero or T is greater than one, then add a message, which is going to be component dot and then we're going to add a runtime message and then grasshopper runtime message level this is an enumerator so we're going to use here warning and we're going to say your parameter is outside the zero one range okay and we're going to close parenthesis and we're going to accept the changes if you see now as soon as I go beyond one, the component goes warning. It's fine. It still works perfectly. But as soon as we also go below zero, the component also goes into warning mode. So I think this is actually kind of nice. It's a very nice way of adding helpful notes in development for users um, just to make them aware of things. Let's see another example. So for example, another example that uh, of something that should display an error is when we operate with vectors and we want to unitize them. Because if you remember, for the most part, we can always unitize vectors, except that if you remember, the operation of unitizing vectors requires dividing by the length of a vector. And if the length is zero, then we can't really, we can't really uh, unitize that vector. So you can see that if the vector is a zero, zero, zero vector, that it's the length is zero, then we don't, we have, we don't have the possibility of unitizing that vector, which, because there, it, ha, it doesn't really have a direction, right? So in this case, this component should probably display an error, even though it still, um, it still spits out the a vector that is the same, right? So something that we could do here is, for example, we could say, if v dot length, if the length of, no, wait, sorry, v dot, and then where is the length of this? If v dot length equals zero, then what we could do is we could say component add runtime message and then grasshopper runtime message level dot error. And we can say cannot unitize a zero length vector, for example. And then we can execute this and we can say that, see that now at this point, we cannot, 
we're getting an error when this is the case. And at this, if we move any of these, we're not getting the error anymore. And then when we go back to zero, we can get, we can also, we get the error. Now, one thing that is interesting is that we can improve this code a little bit because if we remember the v.unitize method, can you see how it returns a Boolean? All right. This is actually super useful because that Boolean is telling us whether if the method was able to successfully unitize the vector or not. So the, what this means is that what we can do is that we can make a bit of, bit of a shorthand and say, I'm going to place this here. All right. And if the result of this equals false, it means that V could not be unitized and therefore something went wrong. Cannot unitize this vector. Okay. And then I'm going to hit OK. And then we have the exact same problem. And now it's working well. And now it's working well. And now it's going to go back to not being able to work well. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so this was learning how to control, learning and understanding what a grasshopper component is, what is the hierarchy between grasshopper components and instances of script components. So we can see how all of this is actually just classes and all the things that we can access are either methods or are either properties that belong to this class. All right. And then because of that, we can access, for example, the component property, which gives us access to a lot of functionality from the parent object, from the component. Or we could also access the properties from the Grasshopper document, from the Dryner document, like for example, where is this file saved on your system? How many components are available in this definition? You can actually mess with the other components. And if you, and if you are familiar with the meta hopper, do I still have it here? I don't know what it is, but I used, I used to have it somewhere. If you're familiar with the Meta Hopper component uh, plugin by Andrew Human, he actually uses a lot of that, a lot of those techniques to, to mess things around and to, to play with the Grasshopper definition itself. Okay. All right. Good. That was great. Thank you for that. And I think what we're going to do is I'm going to record another video where we're going to do a few more hands-on examples on error handling. And we're going to keep working on our plugin. And to certain components, we're going to add error messages and warning messages whenever things don't work correctly. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be the next video. But in the meantime, if you like this video, maybe hit the thumbs up button, maybe subscribe to the channel or Maybe just say a few words of gratitude, tell your friends, I don't know. Uh, whatever you think it works best for you. Okay, thank you very much and see you on the next video. All right. What are we doing, Andres? Good afternoon. How are you doing? How is the hangover from the Acadia workshops, huh? All right, so we don't want this anymore. I don't, I, I'm going to link this back here. And this I already, okay. Did I leave that? We can probably leave that there. Okay, so this is going to be, and then I'm just going to save this into the new file that I'm going to do which is going to be e.5 error handling. And that's going to be uh, okay, that's going to be the next video error handling. Okay. Beautiful. Yes, um, Andres, I just, I literally just recorded a video <laughs> on that, which I'm going to post on my personal channel. And yes, the, the lectures are not going to be available anymore. And um, so where everything that is going to be available now is going to be 
whatever we have here at parametric camp, okay? Um, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. So, okay, so we're going to do error handling, and for that we're going to do remove item, if out of bounds, show warning, return the same list. Remove branch name, branch number, same list. Remove run by path name. Warning if path not found. Remove. Okay. All right. No, this is exercise five. All right. How's everyone else doing? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nurse components, data components. Okay. <laughs> so we're doing intro at the end, correct? Yes. Error handling. Okay, let's do this. What happens if we don't have Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to start with remove item. <sighs> Let's start simple. I think a good place to start is going to be the remove components, the ones that removed items and branches, etc. So for example, let's take a look at this one. If we have a data tree that has three branches and five items, then I can probably remove the first one, the second one, the third one, fourth, the fifth. And then when we go into the sixth one, because there aren't that many elements, you can see that the components themselves already fail. But they fail because the code that is running inside of them, so actually uh, trying to access element number six on the list, is throwing an error. And then the component itself throws the error because the code inside is not working. So I wonder if we can implement something where we handle this. So for example, for remove item, I think what I would like to do is I would like to if the index is out of range, if the index is greater or smaller than the size of the collection, then what I would like to do is I would like to display a warning message, but I would like to still output the full list by like, like, it's, like, it, like it is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to implement some sanity. Oh, oh that did. I'm going to implement some sanity is uh, this is a common way of referring to making some checks and make sure that all the data is correct before actually doing any kind of algorithm, right? So, so what I can do here is I can say sanity is going to be that if i is less than zero, 
if someone messed up with a negative index number for whatever reason, or i is greater than l dot count. So how many elements do we have? If l is greater than that, then it means that this does not work out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say component at runtime warning. And then here I'm going to say this, uh, this sucks so much to type all the time. I will show you in a few videos um, how to develop outside of Grasshopper so that you can get a nice autocomplete. And then here I'm going to say warning. And then I'm going to say index out of bounds. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make sure that I pass out the full, uh, the full thing. I'm going to pass out the full list, all right, as it is without removing anything. So I'm going to say L out is going to be equal to the full list L without doing anything else. All right. Now, this is not going to work entirely. And let me show you why. So I'm going to hit OK. And then I'm going to go back. So now it works well, etc. But now you can see that I'm still getting the error message. And I'm still getting the index out of range problem. This is because I have done some sanity here. All right. I you do the warning message, I spit out the list. But the component, the script still keeps executing. So after this happens, the component still tries to remove that item. So therefore, it hits the error. And that's why the component raises the red, the red error like, oh, this is index out of zero, everything failed, blah, blah, blah. So what I need to make sure is that if this is the case, this is the only code that runs the compiler or the doesn't keep going throughout the code. The only way to do that is that because this is a function that we're executing. And because it's a function that returns void that doesn't return anything, we can at any time during the execution of the function, just type return. And if we type return, then at that point, the function will stop executing, will return void, and then the rest of the code will not execute. So this is the way to put a stop to the execution of the code. And if that is correct, then this should probably work now. All right. So, okay. So it's not working. Then let me take a look at what's going on. Wow, why am I not getting any error of any kind? If i is smaller than zero, oh, off. Because I, I did uh, and. Okay. That was dumb. And so now this works. Okay, and for five, it doesn't work. Okay, all right, that's fine. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> very dumb mistake. I actually made two mistakes. So one is one is that I said that I had to be less than zero and greater than count, which can never happen. So this is actually instead of being an and it should be an or. So that's one thing. So I'm going to run this and you can see that now for the value of 10. This is telling me in this is out of bounds. And it's outputting the full list. And then if I scroll down, you can see that things work except when I hit number five. And that is because I forgot that it's not count, but it's count minus one. So if I do this, now this works. And you can see that now four is good. All of them are good. X five is good. And then the whole thing is output and then any other value is going to work. Okay. 
So you can see that now this component is a little smarter and it gives me better functionality. It doesn't just crash right away. Okay, so all of these practices are actually really good. So the next one we're going to see is a very similar one, which is remove branch, right? So for example, let me crank this up a little bit here. So let's say that I'm going to So I don't even know how many branches we have, but let's say we have 25. Okay. So here at the remove branch, you can see that uh, you can see that at some point, I have way too many branches. How many branches do I have? 12? I have 15 branches. Okay. And then what I'm doing here is that I'm trying to remove some of the earlier one. But then as I go beyond 15, you can see that the component is not really doing anything. So the component is working, it's not crashing. However, it's also not telling me anything about the fact that I'm not removing anything here, that I went beyond the amount of branches that are available in this tree. So I may want to also um, I may want to also clean that up. So I may want to say here, sanity, I'm going to say if I is less than zero, or this time I'm going to do it right, or I is greater than how many branches do we have on the tree. And then we're going to find that by saying t dot branch count. So that's how many branches do I have? If I is greater or equal to that or is greater than this minus one, then what we're going to do is we're going to output an error component, add runtime message, grasshopper runtime warning level dot uh, runtime message level. I never I never remember message level dot is going to be a warning and then index out of bounds and nothing really happens. And in this case, we don't really have to change anything else because since the component was working fine and it was outputting the rest of the tree, we don't need, we don't really need to change the output or we don't really need to do a return here. In this case, we don't need that. So for example, here, in the six out of bounds. And then when I hit 15, I'm still out of bounds, because remember, it's one less. And then for 14 is when I start removing the last branch, if you can see there. So now you see, blah, blah, blah. so this component now works a little better, it's a bit more explicit about what is going on. How are we going to do this one? How are we going to do this one? 10 path exists. Print path exists. Then here, uh -huh, okay. Okay. The last one we're going to do for the remove branches is going to be 
this one here, the one that says remove branch by path. What we can see is that if we right now enter a path that doesn't exist, so for example, 1002, nothing happens. So this basically returns the same branch without any kind of message or any kind of warning. And that is because for whatever reason, the remove path function inside of the tree is not really doing, is not really telling us anything about that. So I wonder if t.removePath returns true or false, whether if it succeeded. And I can see that it doesn't look like that's the case. It's just a void function. So it turns out that I can not use some information from the method to make sure if this operation was successful or not. So the way that I'm going to do this is that I'm going to add a little bit of overhead. Uh, I'm going to say check if path exists. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, another method inside of data trees, which is p dot path exists. So you see that there's a um, there is a method that returns true or false if the path that we're giving it is exists or not. And then what we can see is that t.path exists requ requires a bunch of numbers or is asking for a grasshopper path object, which we already created back before here. So what I can do is if grasshopper, if t.path exists equals equals true, or we know that we can shortcut this, this is the same, right? If this is true, then actually what well, we want to check if it, this is false, right? If this is false, then I can say component dot add runtime message and here grasshopper runtime level runtime message level dot warning and we can say path does not exist but we let the rest of the component work as if uh, nothing had happened because because we want to output the rest of the full path okay so you can see that now at this point, path does not exist. So if I go back to one, this is probably going to work. And if I go back to, if I change this to 200, this doesn't work because this did not exist. Okay, so we can go back here to number two, and that is fine. And then the component works much better now. It gives me some warnings. Okay, beautiful. So how about getting stuff, how about reading from the components? Can we improve those too? Okay, the next ones are going to be get item. So get item number. And I'm going to, so this is negative, doesn't work. Mm -hmm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to add a wrapping. We're going to add wrapping. Mm -hmm. How are we doing battery wise? We're doing good. Okay. 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 Let's take a look at the get item component. The get item component can fetch from a tree from a list, the first, second, third, etc. We've already seen it. It just takes whichever one, right? But if we go beyond how many elements there are, it gives me this error, which comes because this component, this code is actually breaking. It's breaking here because we're using array access on an item that doesn't exist, okay? So we probably want to improve that. First of all, we probably want to implement our own error handlings. And then if and then on top of that, uh, we may actually want to offer an alternative if that doesn't work. So first of all, let's implement our own, uh, our own sanity here. 
So sanity, if if i is less than zero or i is greater or equal to the amount of objects. So okay. So if that's the case, then we we probably want to do is we probably want to say component component add runtime message and that's going to be grasshopper runtime message level dot um, and let's say we do a warning and we say here index out of bounds and then because we're out of bounds what we want to do is we want to make sure that we output something so we're going to say i out is going to be equal to null so an empty object an object that doesn't exist and we stop the execution of the code remember we're doing this so that we don't execute this line and we don't fall on the default error that the component was giving us because this code is just not working all right so i'm going to hit okay and you can see that now we have a warning index out of bounds and we have a null element and here five and then for four we start already having stuff and for minus one it, we don't get anything okay beautiful but if we look at the original component the get item component it's called list item actually you can see that it has the list the item and it has this thing called wrap index which means that let me show you how this works so if i let's compare them side by side so if i have this right and then this is the index and if i if i turn this to false okay then whenever i go out of bounds supply supplied index is too low and if i go to and supplied index is too high you see this component is slightly better designed than what we did because it has two different messages right but it's looking it's it's pretty good however if we turn wrapping on it turns out that it actually spits something outside and what that is is that what it does is that if you're at the last position number four then it gives you the last element but if you go to the next one because it wraps what it does is it calculates that the next one is going all the way to the beginning and then if we go to number six then it's number one and we go to number seven is number two number eight is number three etc etc so it basically makes sure that whatever index you give it even if it's too far too high or too low it gives you one that is proportional to how far away you are from the list okay so we're going to try to implement something because why not what the grasshopper is better than the components that we can implement ourselves no way so i'm going to add a, an input i'm going to name it uppercase w and then i'm going to say that this has to be of the type boolean all right and i'm going to plug this in here as well and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to make some make a trick here and the trick is going to be that if any of this happens what i would like to do is i would like to make sure to maybe i'm going to keep the message from now on but instead of just outputting nothing what i'm going to do is that i'm going to recalculate the value of i so that it stays within boundaries but it stays in a way that is proportional to how far off it is and the way to do that is by using the modulo operator what <laughs> which i promise you sometime in the past that was very useful because remember if you remember the modulo gives us the integer remainder of a division so if the list has five elements and we are at position five five modulo five is five okay but if we ask for position number six six sorry five modulo five is zero actually i'm sorry about that <laughs> but if i say give me the element in position number six if we do six modulo five then the, re the the result of that is going to be the value of one so you can see how it wraps up and it goes back to the beginning and seven modulo five is number two eight modulo five is number three etc etc so what i can just do here is i can say i is going to be equal to whatever i was modulo how many elements that list has l dot count and then instead of returning or stopping we let the rest of the code execute now because we, this i now has a new value 
that has been wrapped to domain from 0 to 5. And let's see if that works. If I do that, you can see that here the elements are the same, but now num for number 5, I get the index out of bounds, but I get the same elements. And for number 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10, we wrap again. And what about minus 1? Uh, minus 1. <laughs> does not work because we need to implement a modulo that it returns a positive um, a positive um, value, which actually that one I'm going to leave as an exercise for you, the viewer, okay? How to fix that. But at least it's gonna work for positive values. All right, beautiful. What are we doing next? Uh, um. So actually, C sharp REPL. Uh, okay, so console. So how much is minus one modulo five? Minus one. Okay. Um, if so, if I do minus five, it's zero. Oh, this is very slow, actually. And if I do minus six, it's going to be minus one. Okay, so that gets solved by just doing here the absolute value, no? Math, the absolute value of this stuff here. All right? Mm, no, because I get number one. And because this is wrapping, yes. Yeah, that is not going to work. Yeah. Huh, interesting. So how can we fix that actually? You know what? Let's do it ourselves because otherwise. <clears throat> and actually, wait, so wait, we can look this up on, on the Grasshopper Sharp project, right? How cool is that? So Grasshopper Sharp, so we have sources, we have sets, list, and for list, let's take a look at how the code was. So list item is going to be here and then, um, okay. Check if the index is within the length of this, if index is present, else if wrap index, wait, that is, does this work for negative inputs? Hmm, maybe it doesn't, maybe we didn't implement it right. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, no. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, we found an error <laughs> on the project. <laughs> okay, set list. So let's just flag it. Then issues, um, grasshopper sharp, new issue, the list uh, item component fails for negative wait so maybe the wrapping function was not uh where where is this oh yeah it was true so oops what have i done so let's submit a Request for negative integers. Uh, when i when i is less than one, the component fails with wrapping active. Okay, so a new issue, and I'm going to assign Bava who was the creator of this component, see if she can fix it. 
and uh, hope she can take a look at this. Uh, okay. And how are we going to fix that in our code? So uh, yeah, we can probably do this. So this is not cool. All right, so okay, I'm going to leave this here, which is what we've done. And then I'm going to copy, I'm going to, oh no, what have I done? Okay, so if i is less than zero, then supply index is too low. Index is too low. Hey, D back. What's up? And then else if I is greater than whoop, I is greater than that, then index is too high. And then this should go here. And then Well, something we can do is we can say while I is less than zero, we can say I incremented by L count. This is really, this is not very clean. <laughs> and then once it's over zero or equal to zero, then we do this. Well, this works. It's not very clean, but but it does the trick. But I don't like it. It's kind of this. There's gotta be like a more straightforward way of making this, of doing this. Um, maybe we can multiply. Mm. Hmm. Nice. Ah, oh, I'm a little <laughs> most of super jet lag, by the way. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a. Do I want to get into this mess? Um, actually, I don't want to get into this mess, but I do want to leave it like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to. Okay. Well, actually, I thought it through and I didn't want to leave it like that. So I went ahead and I wrote some code to fix the problem. So now we have in the sanity section, we have two situations. One where I is greater than the length of the list. And in that case, we just uh, give out one message and then we do what we did before. But then when I is negative, what I have done is this is very, very bad code. There's got to be a better way to do this, but I've just written an infinite, I've, written, I've just written a while loop and that as long as I is less than zero, 
it keeps adding to the value of i the amount of value, the amount of elements on the list, so that at some point it goes positive or zero. And then at that point, we find, um, we do this, which I think it should also be, I don't think we actually need this. Yeah, sorry, I'm really jet lagged right now. So this is probably not the best code I've written in my life, you know? <laughs> anyway, but this now should work if I go negative. You can see that now I'm respecting the same pace of the original component and I'm also respecting the order of wrapping correctly. Okay, beautiful. So we can, we can then just do that uh, and leave it like that. All right. So what is the next one that we're going to do? What about getting the branch of a component? Well, this is going to be pretty much the same thing. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get um, we're going to get the branch by the number we're getting for each for each um, for this tree for the tree. Wow, I'm really get like <laughs> today. Sorry, I apologize. So if the tree has 15 branches, we're going to retrieve a branch not by the path name, but we're going to retrieve it by its position. So you can see the first one. You can see the second one, you can see the third one, and we're outputting them also with the tree. We did this in the previous video. Okay, so how are we now going to make sure that we don't go that we don't go overflow to the top or to the bottom? Well, we're also going to implement here some sanity. All right. And we're going to say, if I is less than t dot, uh, branch count. So if I is less, if I is less than zero, okay, or I is greater than T dot branch count minus one, then we can say component add runtime message grasshopper runtime message level dot warning. And then we say index is out of bounds. And then we output nothing from the component. And we stop the execution. Because we don't want to hit uh, anything that we don't want to do. So if we do that, then you can see that this let's see if we snap this negative. So if we go in negative, we get a warning and just like it's index out of bounds index is out of bounds. And then also here, we get an in, we get a we get a warning. And if you were interested, you can also implement here wrapping, just like we did before, we can just wrap and then we can make sure that we just go back to the beginning and start taking from the beginning. Okay, that could be another way to go. And then get by path here, we're going to do something exactly exactly like what we did here. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to find the path. And then we're going to check if the path exists, then and if the path doesn't exist, then we're going to say path does not exist. And then b is going to be equal to no. And then we're going to stop the execution of this because we don't want to get into this whole mess. Now, if we see that this doesn't exist. Okay, so this is removed. Okay, and this one also doesn't work. And then here we have one, and then we have 200. And this one also doesn't work is the path just does not exist. Okay, so we're going to go back to to the original. All right. Okay, so I think this was a good introduction to error handling and to give her to give him better feedback to users about what's going on in the components. In general, that is a, that's a super, super good practice because black boxes can be nice uh, for very beginners. But as soon as we get comfortable with any platform, we actually want to know what's going on. So getting information about possible errors and things that are not going good is actually a very good thing, just as it is to make sure that we understand, we, we select and we design carefully which information the components are outputting if the user finds themselves into such errors. Okay, so this is a good thing for us finding safe defaults for um, errorful, errorful situations. Okay, 
With this, I'm going to leave it here uh, and we're going to move on to the next video in this series. We're going to keep learning more uh, about Grasshopper components and how they're written. And if you found this useful, as usual, maybe like this video, maybe subscribe to the channel, maybe turn on notifications, etc. Uh, etc. Et okay, thank you very much. See you in the next video. <clears throat> hey, Leonardo, I can recommend uh, Robert Woodbury's um, Robert Woodbury's uh, what was his name? Oh, I'm really jet lagged. How am I so jet lagged? Oof. Uh, sorry, elements of parametric design. Woodbury Elements of Parametric Design. So this book is really good for geometry stuff. Uh, I also want to recommend Raja Issa's publications. So she's got a few publications, Essential Mathematics for Computational Design, uh, Essential Algorithms and Data Structure. They're all free and available on McNeil and I also want to recommend um, what's the name of the book I also want to recommend Kyle Steinfeld uh, Kyle Steinfeld geometry com geometry computations foundations for design this book is really really nice for geometry it's very beautifully illustrated only problem is that the sample it samples uh, the examples are written in Python, so <laughs> and the syntax is a little different, you know. And of course, we don't like Python in this channel, right? 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 <laughs> so yeah, so I would recommend this. Three. Okay, and now I have to record the introduction, and that's going to be it for today. Okay, so the introduction is going to be. Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to a new video on this series advanced mm, uh, what? Advanced development in Grasshopper, exactly. So uh, what are we doing in this video? This is going to be a hands-on. We're going to continue developing the plugin, the Parametric Camp plugin that we've been doing in this series. And for this video, what I would like to teach you is hands-on examples of how to do error handling. And error handling is the situation where some the code for some reason um, fails and it fails because the operations that we are demanding from the code are just not possible or because we're um, or because something in the code is poorly written so there are actually techniques to make sure that even if the code fails we can the default to safe values and we can also give users um, warnings and information about those errors so for example if i am trying to get an item from a list that doesn't exist then maybe finding this uh, giving this kind of uh, warnings about hey the index is too high you shouldn't be doing this or maybe if the you're giving it a negative value which is something that you shouldn't have then maybe index is out of bounds or if you're giving it a path that just doesn't exist then the component will give you some warnings about that so all of that in grasshopper is very doable and I'm going to teach you in this video some techniques of how to implement error handling in grasshopper components so that you can give more informed feedback to your users. This is typically a very good um, practice because it helps people understand what's going on. Okay, so let me show you that. But before we do that, just make sure that you check my previous video where I explain how I did this. Okay, so let's get hands on. Mm, okay. I forgot to put a toggle here. 
Boolean in toggle. Okay. Oh, I'm always doing it. I'm not even checking if this. Oh. If W, then then copy this here. Else, oh, that was bad. Oop. Else, I out equals no, and then yes. That sucks. It would have been nice to explain this. Uh, uh, okay, whatever. I'm going to move the sanity here so that it doesn't. Because if we're flipping, then. Up. All right. So that would have been nice to explain in the video, but at this point, I think I lost it. So, okay. All right. Beautiful. Uh, at least that's going to go into the files. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And I think that's going to be it for today because I'm not in a good place to do this, to doing this. And I guess I'll see you uh, next time we stream, which is probably going to be next week at some point. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.